okay so so uh so i don't want you to basically think of devsecops as as devops lipstick on a traditional security pig and so i have this this alternative definition and and it involves the first phrase there is empowering engineering teams to take ownership of the security of their software but you don't want to do it you know and just sort of like say hey you know just take ownership um, you want to do it in a DevOps way. And the, and the three ways of DevOps are this flow, feedback, and a culture of experimentation and learning. Um, but the one underlying thing that you have to keep in mind is that the reason companies invest in the development of software is, is to satisfy some need of their customers. And, and so, so if you're not delivering value in the form of usable software, you're not, you may as well not have it be secure because nobody, nobody cares if it's, if it's, if it's uh, secure, uh, if you have no uh, users. So, so you really have to always focus on delivering um, value in the form of software. And, and that's why I, I like, to the extent that I like any phrase, DevSecOps over Sec DevOps. Um, uh, you know, so because I, I really think the dev has to come first. You have to be de developing software uh, in order to 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 be satisfying that last bullet there. Um, so Gene Kim is 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 largely considered the sort of the godfather of DevOps. Um, there's a few other folks that um, have contributed. Uh, uh, Nicole Forsgren, her Accelerate book, um, the the DevOps Handbook, which includes those two folks. Um, as, as well as uh, 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 a number of other people contributing um, to that. And, um, but I, there's two quotes that I'm going to come back to. And of course, the talk is sort of structured around the three ways of DevOps. Um, improving daily work is even more important than doing daily work is one of the quotes. And the idea here is that, you know, yeah, if you get just sort of like, let's just get it out as quickly as possible, but you don't think of how you could do it better in the future, then you'll never get to high levels of maturity and high levels of efficiency. And so it's actually more important to focus on that improving thing than it is to focus on that doing thing, which is hard sometimes. Um, and then this, this theory of constraints idea here is that improvements made anywhere besides the bottleneck are an illusion. Um, and and it, it, that's essentially Gene Kim's way of sort of emphasizing the theory of constraints. Um, so we're going to come back to those in, in a little bit. And, and the first, the second quote there is is really sort of the key quote for the first way of DevOps, which is flow. And and you know, flow involves a, a lot of a lot of concepts uh, uh, around small batch sizes, around visualizing the flow with a cumulative flow diagram. It's in the name, value stream map mapping. Um, you know, there's lots of concepts associated with how you do you do flow well. Um, so I'm going to focus on the specifics for 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 DevSecOps and for security. So I'm, I'm not I'm not I'm not discounting those others, but I'm going straight to the things that I think are mat, uh, matter most. And and so uh, one of the things that it's important to keep the system in flow and the developers in that system in flow is to essentially provide them with feedback at the right moment. If you provide it too early, it's going to interrupt their their concentration and their ability to produce value, the functionality of the software. If you provide it too late, then they've already moved on to something else, and you'll have to interrupt that that new something else. And so, this idea of of giving it at the right time, I think, is is perfectly uh, con uh, situated with the pull request. So, if you give that feedback, any kind of feedback, quality feedback, security feedback at the pull request, that is the ideal place to do it. Now, a lot of pipelines are not engineered to do it there. They're, by, they're engineered such that a lot of the work that determines the feedback happens after the merge occurs. And so, so you have to rejigger to make that happen. It's an engineering effort that has to happen. Um, you, for, first of all, people need to be convinced of that. And this will help you with the convincing folks of that to, to incur that engineering cost. Um, the other lesson that I, I sort of, and this is a little bit, I'm not, I'm not completely serious, it's a little bit hyperbolic, what I'm saying in this second lesson here, is that any service level agreement of greater than a day is essentially harmful to flow. So if you can't fix the problem the day you created the problem, then the cost of fixing it goes up dramatically over time. 
Um, and, and, and part of that cost is associated with interrupting flow, although not all of it. Um, there's task switching and things like that, which I guess are aspects of flow as well. Um, so, so, you know, if your security group says, well, you have 30 days to fix a critical and, and 60 days to fix a high severity um, vulnerability and, and 180 days to fix a medium severity, those, those SLAs don't really help. If you, if you can't fix it the day it was injected, you're going to increase the costs. So you're better off saying, I don't care about highs and mediums at first. I'm just going to care about the criticals, but I want you to fix them the day they're detected. And, and that is, that is a, a way to sort of maximize this flow. Now, then you can later expand the scope to high, include highs. And, and we're going to talk about how you go about doing that. Before that, though, I want to sort of give you the, the promised argument for why the pull request is the ideal place. And it all has to do a lot of times with developer psychology and development team sociology. So developers are, are proud of the code they wrote that morning. And, and the way they get validation for that work, the way they feel like they're contributing to their team's goals is if that code gets accepted into the development branch, usually is the next highest level branch above the feature branch that the developer is working on. It, and that, that, that getting accepted in occurs in the form of a pull request. Now, everyone realizes that a pull request includes a code review. So there's, there's humans that are going to look at, at your code. And so you want it to be as good as possible. And it, 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 you, you care, you're proud, you want to be proud of your work, and you don't want to get, you know, to look, be embarrassed by your, by your code. But what's more and more common over time, and it has been true for many years, but you can add extra checks to the pull request so that it's not just human code review that occurs before the merge decision is made, but you have automated checking checks that occur. You can do unit tests, you can do end-to-end -end tests, you can do style checkers, you can do um, uh, various levels of security testing. And, and so basically what I'm suggesting is you layer these things into the pull request check functionality, extra branch protection, status checks, I think is sort of the, the full name, but I think everyone just sort of calls them checks now at this point. Um, and that means that when the pull request gets to a reviewer finally, that all those automated checks will all have a green check mark next to them, very satisfying green check mark. None of them will have a, an amber warning or a red X. And if, and if it's a critical check, then you'd want to block the merge if it had a red X or an amber warning um, on it. And so you, you wouldn't even be able to merge it for a critical check. Um, and so they will jump through a lot of hoops to make sure that they're all green check, mark, check marks there. Um, later, if something's found and they've already moved on to something else and it isn't stopping them from getting their code they wrote that morning merge, they're much less motivated to jump through those same hoops for, for a fix for a vulnerability that was basically injected three weeks or three months or three years ago. They're much more likely to, to care about it if it's the code they wrote that morning. Um, also, there's, they're, they're very familiar with the code. So that feedback will, will give them say, oh yeah, I know that I, the, the, the flow of data goes from here to here to here. I, I guess I didn't validate it at this point. Let me go, and they can quickly find the place where they need to fix it. So it, 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 there's an efficiency uh, concept of doing it there as well. Um, so that's why doing it at the pull request is, is the best time to do it. Um, okay, so back to our question about sort of where is the bottleneck for application security since improvements made anywhere besides the bottleneck. And, and so I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna set this up with a, a little bit and, and, and uh, let me pull up the chat here. So you can answer this in the chat. Uh, and if, if we don't get a great response, I'll just move on anyway. But, but if you could improve only one thing, um, which would it be? Would you rather improve, improve your ability to completely detect all the vulnerabilities in the in the in the in the in the software, or would you rather improve your ability to rapidly resolve a vulnerability once detected? Um, so, give me your vote, one or two here, if you could, in the chat. We got we got one vote here. It's a couple of votes. Okay, we got a little bit of groupthink going on here because because as soon as someone everyone's voting two, 
So both of them. Okay. Well, I, I set it up as an either or because I'm, I'm forcing you to pick the bottleneck that you're going to work on. So the consensus here, and every time I've done this survey, it's it's been anywhere from two thirds of the people saying it's number two to 90% of the people saying it's number two. Um, in this case, we're basically closer to that 90% um, uh, saying that it's number two. So what that means is that a lot of times we're rolling out tools all wrong. We're rolling out tools as if number one was the bottleneck. We, we tend to say, well, we bought the tool, we're paying for the licenses. I wanna get that scanning across the widest swath of applications as I can afford with the licenses we've paid. And, 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 and we put all our energy and all of our project planning and all of our effort into getting the scanning going. And that really just, solves a problem, makes an improvement somewhere other than the bottleneck. When we really need to be focused on getting rapid resolution, even if it's a smaller swath that you're looking at. And so that's that's a that's a, a key learning about, about this. And, and it would make you change the way you'd roll out tools. Um, so if, if that's the case, then a, 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 we are rolling out tools largely wrong because we, we're rolling them out as though number one were the bottleneck. Um, so instead of going wide, you go depth first. So pick one team, pick one application, pick one tool category like software composition analysis tools um, or SAS tools or IS tools. Um, turn the policy dial down until the team is willing to commit to fixing all of the findings with that relatively low policy dial um, in one or two sprints, maybe maximum of three sprints. And so. Frequently, this is basically just criticals for software composition analysis, let's say, and 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 that can take them a couple of sprints to sort of sort of sort of do that. Um, then once you do that, um, install a status check in the pull requests. Um, it, 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 so we're, while we're working on whittling that one down for the first two sprints. Um, it's not a required status check. So it's just going to give them that, that amber warning, but it's not going to block the merge. They're going to be able to keep producing work for a couple of weeks. But it's going to be reminding them that pretty soon we're going to switch that to a required status check and it will block the merge. So they better work on it while, they're, while it's convenient for them to work on it. Um, and when the scan is clean, you switch it to a required status check and block the merge. And, and now you've got a median time to resolve of less than a day for this very low, relatively low policy dollars. But remember, it's just the critical. So it's the most risky things. So you're actually addressing the biggest portion of the risk and you're doing it super rapidly, but you're ignoring other risk at this point. Um, but of course we don't stop there. We install a second check in not required mode for the next increment of the policy dial. So if the team says we're gonna increment to software composition analysis, high severity, then that's the next thing. Or you could switch to SAS findings or IAS findings critical as the next thing that you, that you think is the most important to work on. Um, and, and you can even get more fine grained than that. So you don't, if, if, if you have hundreds of high findings, then maybe, maybe you only want to say, okay, well, let's just pick a third of them with these five CWEs and we're just going to focus on those for the next policy dial setting. Um, so at any given moment in time, you have a required check that's at this sort of criticals blocking the merge. And then you have this informed, informing check at sort of the, the highs. Um, and, and you keep moving these two bars until you get to the point where the juice is not worth the squeeze anymore. Um, and then you move on to the next tool category or application or team. And you can launch several of these efforts in parallel before they reach success. Um, so you don't have to you don't have to sort of completely do them serially, but 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 don't maximize the parallelization of the scanning across the board before you do any of the resolution. We'll focus on scanning and resolution for one, maybe two, maybe three, maybe ten, maybe fifty, but you know not all five hundred apps um, even get scanning going. So depth first rather than than um, breadth first is the idea. So um, some tips to, to pulling this off. So this is, it's really helpful to have uh, tools with low false positives. So developers don't trust the tools. They're much less likely to respond to them if they have low trust in the tool. They're more likely to say, well, this is blocking the merge. I'm just gonna turn it off. And then, and then you basically back to square one with that, with that team. 
Um, so you really want a tool that 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 if it reports a finding, it really is a finding. And and that's the primary reason why I'm at at contrast, because because contrast uses a different technique for finding vulnerabilities in the code you write called IAST instead of SAST. And this is not a talk about the difference between IAST and SAS, but the but the 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 bottom line is that IAS tools have near zero false positives. If it reports that it's a problem, it's a problem, and and they have no sort of reduction in the ability to find true positives for for that trade off. So, um, with a couple of caveats, obviously, you know, there's there's trade offs to any tool decision, but but IAS is strongly favored over SAS for this reason, for this low false positive rate. For that. And the way that Contrast does software composition analysis uses that same IAST engine um, or can, you know, in, in the optimal situation, uses that same IAST engine and you get extra benefits, low false positives, uh, actually a lower number of findings altogether, um, and only the findings that are real um, with even software composition analysis findings, the code you import, the, the third party libraries there. Um, also, as a security group, I'm going to tell you not to triage the findings. Feed them directly back to the development team. The only thing you as a security group need to worry about is where that team's policy dial is at. And that should be completely transparent to you. And that should be something you coach teams on. But you don't actually concern yourself with individual findings. You're feeding them directly back to the development team and even the individual developer with the pull request. And, and that's a big leap for a lot of folks, but this is key because you're gonna need that time to do some other things. So with the labor that you save from doing that triaging work, your job is to make sure the tools really run well, that you pick the right tools, that they're configured well, that anytime there's a false positive, you escalate it to the vendor. And, and here's a list of sort of the things you can do to make sure that the tools um, run well. I'm not gonna walk through the A, B, C, D, E, list here, but you know, it's in the deck for you to you to look at later. I'm going to keep moving here. By the way, if you have questions, I know I, I'm, I won't address them till the end for the most part, but please be putting them in as we go. Or, or if you have a challenge, like this will never work because of this, please, I'd love to sort of get a chance to to um to to hear that from you and get a chance to sort of address it. And I, I've got those, uh, the chat and the and the Q&A um, windows up on my screen here, my, my other screen. So I can actually see them as they, as they come in and I may decide to, to answer them close to when I, I spoke about the, the issue. Uh, okay, so that's flow. Uh, and I've ta we've talked a little bit about feedback as well already there. So I'm, I'm not gonna talk about um, uh, uh, all aspects of feedback because I feel like we've already addressed some of the big aspects of feedback. So I'm going to focus this feedback section, the second way of DevOps, on metrics um, as sort of the, the a form of feedback. And um, I use a cumulative flow diagram. So you, you know, my the the line between my concept of flow and feedback is really pretty pretty slight because uh, you know I'm using a cumulative flow diagram. Um, so the way this cumulative flow diagram works is this top orange line goes up when new vulnerabilities are found, and this green line catches up with it when they're resolved. And this blue area goes up when false positives, are, when, when things are marked as false positives. And so a lot of times that's not the way this, that teams are measured. They basically are just measured on this green line. Oh, well, we resolved uh, 1,200 things in the last year. Um, great, good job. No, not good job. This is an unhealthy curve. Because it, essentially, this orange line is growing away from the green line. It, the risk is getting worse. And the only place where they significantly closed the gap was when they marked a bunch of things as false positives. And you have to wonder if they weren't just marking them as false positives just to get them off their plate or if they were really marking them as false positives. Now, down here is, is a completely different curve that is very healthy. The, 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 the findings started coming in and the team sort of started resolving them and, they, and then they got into a, hey, let's just resolve them. This is um, with the policy dial of criticals and highs being blocked um, and they quickly resolved them. Now, now, this is another interesting part that you can tell the story from this human photogram. They marked a bunch of things as false positives here on this day. And so my team at the time, this, this is data from my time at Comcast, my team at the time was monitoring these markings of false positives and we, 
met with this team and we basically said, so wh where did these false positives come from? And we confirmed that they were real false positives. This team wasn't just trying to get work off their plate. And so we reconfigured the rule. We were using a SAS tool that allowed us to modify the rule. We modified the rule so that it would still find the same problem, but not the false positive versions of that problem. And when we did that, which took us a couple of weeks to accomplish, then a bunch of other things that were sort of falling under that got automatically resolved essentially by this curve. And so, so, um, so that's where this step function here came from is when the, when the rules got fixed essentially. And so this shows a very healthy sort of the team, healthy pattern of the team itself, the development team working, as well as the security team partnering with the development team in the in terms of taking ownership of the problem with the tool false positives is the big problem of the tool that i'm talking about here um so uh we have a uh, question come in i'm gonna i said I, I i would i would answer them if i thought they were appropriate close to that so um does contrast is solution offer any ability to test rest graph ql i see dast in a modern cloud architecture um, to be very limited value. I agree totally with DAST um, uh, for you. It's, 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 it's very hard for a DAST tool to actually find things. Um, and and it, there's a lot of work in configuring the DAST tool to find things. Um, so certainly we have very robust uh, support for REST. In fact, I would say most of the rules we have uh, are focused on, on sort of REST APIs. We do have GraphQL support for a couple of languages, and and um, I don't know those off the top of my hell of my head. Um, it's robust. With one of those languages, been around for for uh, a long time, several quarters, if not several years at this point. Um, it's relatively new with one of the other languages, and we have it targeted for several other languages to add GraphQL support, as well as other non-HTTP data sources like message queues is also in the works. So we're keeping up with modern architectures in, in terms of our ability there with contrast. Um, okay, so back to metrics. Um, so this is a way I visualize team maturity um, of an organization. And so the greener, the better. And then I also use a cumulative flow diagram over time to see. So this is basically just a, you know, a, a coach sitting down and working with the team and sort of helping them self-assess themselves on whether or not they are, are actually doing this practice to the point of producing value. And so this one for secrets management, um, all of the 10 teams in this visualization are doing a pretty good job of it. And this one team, we, we don't have the blue indicates, we don't have any, um, any input from them yet. We haven't done a, a self-assessment with them yet. Um, and then a couple other practices they're doing pretty good at. And then the rest of the practices, they're at various stages of maturity in the organization of adopting. And so you can use feedback, feedback like this to target your improvements. And, and then you can track it over time using a cumulative flow diagram as well. More green is better. Darker green is better in this visualization. And, and this is what the transformation blueprint tool does. This is basically generates this visualization and this cumulative flow diagram and allows you to sort of input the data, the self-assessment data, the gap analysis data, and help teams make plans for improvement. Um, back to metrics, uh, sort of hardcore metrics instead of qualitative metrics like the prior page, um, there are two metrics. Many of you in the DevOps world are familiar with the DORA metrics from the Accelerate book. And um, you know those four metrics are really very DevOps oriented, um, but aren't very security oriented. And um, I, I actually like these two um, for quality and security, both quality and security feedback. Uh, and and the, the me median time to resolve is sort of traditional uh, MTTR. There's a problem with MTTR, though, um, because it, it, it punishes development teams. The metric will, will sort of get worse when you resolve a really old finding. And so you will, don't ever want to discourage people from resolving the oldest findings. So this cumulative days open correlates highly with MTTR in the long run, but it actually do doesn't have that effect of punishing people. It also responds more quickly since there's no sliding window. Um, if you make a fix today, then the metric calculation tomorrow will be better in a cumulative days open um, calculation, whereas it won't. It'll take the, the, the width of the sliding window for it to get better for MTTR. So I, I actually like cumulative days open there. And I'll be glad to talk to anyone about these metrics 
and how you generate them uh, offline as well. Um, I have uh, given a talk at the RSA conference where it's called the impact of DevSecOps quantified, where I essentially use uh, those metrics as well as metrics about outcomes, the metrics about practice adoption and, and, and the, the green radar chart that you saw there correlated with outcomes like vulnerabilities found in production. And you can see that the teams that, that, that follow these, these uh, DevSecOps practices have one sixth as many vulnerabilities found in production as the teams that are not following that. And, and so at, the, at this point, we had about 150 teams um, that had just gotten into the program. Um, some of them were at very low levels of maturity. Some had been in the program long enough to be at high levels of maturity. Um, and and we, we could measure the difference between between those those two groups. Eventually, we got all 600 teams into the program and, and they're still working on maturing those 600 teams. Actually, I talked to someone last night that it might be up to 700 teams in the Comcast program now uh, since they the acquisition of Sky and the addition of Sky teams to the to the program. So um, so so if you want to uh, Google my name and RSA, uh, an impact of DevSecOps quantified. You can find a YouTube. This is a link to the to the to the RSA conference one, um, but you can directly find the YouTube that that finds it. Or if if you ping me, I, I can I can send you the YouTube link directly. Um, okay. So the third way of of DevSecOps is a culture of experimentation and learning. And so a, a lot of this has to do with the the sort of trust. The, the culture of sort of being allowed to make experiments that might fail. So, so safe to fail environment. Um, and so this really is a cultural thing, even more so than the other two that we've talked about, which are also cultural things to a large degree. But this is very much uh, a function of, of, of culture. Um, and, and, and so the idea is you really wanna sort of encourage people to learn from every thing that goes wrong. And, and, and you want them to feel okay to take risks that might not pan out because you're gonna learn from that. And, and you're much more likely to be willing to take risks if you know that the team adapts based on that feedback. Um, and so this is where the quote from the second quote from Gene Kim or the first quote from Gene Kim I had on that earlier slide, improving daily work is even more important than doing daily work. That's the culture of experimentation and learning quote for him. Um, and, and so, I, I have this thing that, that goes back decades actually um, called the, it was originally the defect three-step. Um, it comes from, uh, uh, Watts Humphrey was a, a mentor of mine. Uh, he, he's the founder of the capability maturity model, which eventually turned in the CM, into the CMMI. Um, and Watts had this thing called the defect three-step. And I've adapted it a little bit here, the words at least, and the sort of expanded it to vulnerabilities and incidents. But basically the idea here is you don't want to think of these things as checkboxes where you just fix them. You know, you do want to do that, obviously, uh, uh, but you want to do more than that. You want to take that thing that happened and turn it into a pattern of some sort. And then you want to look for that pattern everywhere else. And, and so you find and fix everywhere that kind of problem um, occurred, even if it wasn't found by a defect detector or a vulnerability detector if it didn't cause an incident. Don't just fix the one thing that caused the incident, fix all the ones that are like that that are likely to cause a similar incident in the future. And then you want to prevent you from ever injecting one like that in the future. And, and I, I, I contend that this last one is a hundred times more valuable than this first one. I mean, that's a sort of very rough approximation, but. But the you know uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure it is is definitely true. If you never write a vulnerability, then you know you don't have or have to worry about the work it takes to fix it to get it out of the the product or the risk associated with it having been in there in the first place. And so that's what you really want to shoot for is this preventing future occurrences. And you have to. And you only get to that if you have this culture of experimentation and learning, and you think of any, any defect or vulnerability or incident as a learning opportunity rather than just a checkbox that needs to get checked. Um, there's this concept of contextual learning that is very appropriate here. Um, uh, so this is research goes back 100 years. It was originally targeted at K through 12 education, but I've adapted it here for sort of uh, developer 
Um, and, and the three pillars of contextual learning are situated, social, and distributed. And the hedgehog is essentially um, this, when all three of these conditions overlap, the maximum amount of learning occurs. And this is where what happens in the pull request. So it's situated because the developer needs this thing to get fixed in order for the um, pull request to get not get blocked in the merge. Um, it's social because their teammates will see that there's a vulnerability in there and if they, if they don't fix it. And so they're encouraged to fix it. And then and what that means I might have to learn how to fix a SQL injection. Um, and it's distributed, meaning that it aligns with organizational priorities. And so if your organization sets up a program like the one I'm describing, then that will certainly sort of motivate people to, to be in compliance with that desire of their, of their whole organization. And so situated, social, distributed are the three pillars of contextual learning and the pull request just sort of maximizes that. So giving feedback provides maximum learning value. And a developer who gets through a contextual learning session on SQL injection, they never knew about it before, but it got found in the code they wrote that morning and they fixed it that afternoon, they are never gonna write another SQL injection ever again. And this doesn't apply to this app, it applies to anything that team produces or even any other team they go to work for. And certainly any other organization, maybe you don't care about that. So hopefully they don't move on, but, but, um, but, but it, you'll basically will be a community improving the whole community by having this developer having learned that in a very deep way, send them to a class, much less effective, give them a secure coding class where someone lectures to them about SQL injection. They're still likely to write one again, it's because it wasn't contextual enough. It wasn't deep enough, that learning. Um, so I have this, um, you know, open source project that's in the works. It's, I've got one alpha customer for it right now, and I'm, I'm signing up folks to get ready to, to, for the open beta. Um, I have to admit, I haven't worked on it much in the last few months because uh, I've been busy, but uh, hopefully over the holiday season, which is usually when I write the most code every year, um, I'll, I'll be able to sort of uh, get it to beta um, uh, by the end of the holiday period. So please hit transformation.dev and um, sign up for the, the open, open beta when it's available, uh, hopefully in a few months from now. Um, that's all the, the time I have uh, uh, for or the, all the content I have for you today. Um, I, I'd love to answer your questions either either uh, in the chat in the QA window here today. Uh, so keep start putting those in if you haven't been putting them in already. And um, if if you'd rather meet up with me offline and maybe have more of a conversation than just ask a question, um, please connect with me on LinkedIn. Or even if you just want to connect with me on LinkedIn and see future stuff that I publish, um, I'll be glad to uh, accept your your connection on LinkedIn. Um, but you can use that to DM me and ask me for links or slides, and, and I'll be glad to send those to you as well. I'll, I'll, I'll stay, stick around for a few minutes here and wait to see if there's more questions that come in. So far, I uh, answered the one question we already have. And thank you, Anthony, for your compliment. Did you have any questions as a co-host here? Oh, no, no, no. The, the presentation was very lucid, very understandable. Great, thank you. Um, oh, yes, I will answer that, Anthony. Yep, definitely. We, will, we, we are recording it. It will be available on YouTube early next week. Uh, we'll post it on YouTube and also post it on LinkedIn. Well, thank you, everyone. Appreciate your you participating today. Oh, question. Oh, how, wait, do how do you prefer to train, to train developers? developers? Um, yeah, I, so I actually had a slide for that, and, and I, I, I hid it because I, I, I was uh, afraid it was going into a little too much um, detail. So I'll uh, pull that up here. Um, so I actually studied this. There were there were sort of five different ways that 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 developers were being trained at Comcast, and and once I had enough data to correlate the the that training with outcomes like vulnerabilities found in production, 
um, I started to do some quantitative analysis on the effectiveness of those various different ways. And one of them was sort of a traditional uh, 40 hours of video-based training. And, and uh, that was the least effective um, or, or, or training that we had. It was also the most expensive training that we had. Um, and then the couple other ways were sort of less bad and less expensive, um, but they still were not, the juice was not worth this, the, the squeeze. Um, the only two that I really found worked well was um, a wargaming training. Uh, so uh, tools like code bashing or secure code warrior, I actually have a mug from them. Um, uh, so I don't know if you can, it gets, it's hard to get it to go, get into focus, but um, secure code warrior is the, the name of the, of the company. There you go. If I put it next to me, it, it's, it's in focus. Um, they, uh, they have a, a wargaming tool. Basically, um, developers find this to be fun. Basically, they're given vulnerable code, and then they're coached through how to hack it, which is really where the fun is. It's, oh, man, I was able to steal your data. And then, then the light bulb goes off. They're like, oh, wait, I was able to steal the data. Wait, do I write code like that? Oh, I might write code like that. How do I not write code like that? And so that's really been pretty effective. It's also pretty quick. So in a two to three hours worth of training and, you know, basically five minute modules, one per vulnerability type, one per CWE, um, you can you can get pretty effective training. Um, so that that was very effective. But the really best, most effective training is this just in time contextual training right in the pull request. So once a like, a, let's say a SQL injection is found in your code, a link from there to the one lesson the wargaming lesson that ha was just on SQL injection, that was by far the most effective way because, because it was much more efficient. It was only likely to lead them to learning that was something they're likely to write with their environment, their context, their, their skill level. Um, and, and so it was efficient in that you didn't ac actually go through a lot of learning that they'd already had or they would never need anyway. Um, so it was efficient that way. But the other other... Other way is that it's very contextual. They care a lot about that learning because they need it for their code to get merged in the afternoon. And so those are the two kinds of training that I think are sort of highly effective. And anything that's sort of lecture style or even self-paced video kind of training, completely ineffective, waste of, waste of money, waste of time. Hopefully that answered your question. Okay, other questions for Larry? Sometimes you just have to wait long enough for the questions to come in. People, people are still <laughs> yeah. thinking, or they're shy a little yeah. bit. Or, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, I'm, and I'm absolutely in, um, in consonance with what you said about training. In fact, when, uh, when I was consulting another company, this is exactly what we did. But we did sit for one day, show this is a vulnerability type on our demo application. Are we able to find this vulnerability type in the application that you developed? So this was a bunch of 10 developers and we did exactly that style of training. Worked very well with the development team. And they're proud of their code. So instead of us finding vulnerabilities in their code, well, they find it, they own it, they fix it, and it just works. Exactly, better. exactly, exactly. That's why I, I don't like the triaging. I mean, the whole sort of security group sort of calling your baby ugly all day long. It's like... Nobody wants to be in that job unless you're a little sick in the head and you enjoy calling someone's baby ugly all day. And so you end up with some people in that role that is sort of get a thrill out of basically catching people out, which is not what you want. That's not a culture of collaboration that you want. And it also is not received very well either. So it's not very effective, but yeah. Oh, we do have one have more a, question. Have more do we have questions. time? Should yes, we do sir. it or should I do it? We do, line? we do, we do. Please, please go in and answer them. Okay. Um, can you define an organizational structure that fully realizes DevSecOps? Where I'm at now, we have a security engineering team and the DevOps team. So when you say DevOps team, I think you're, you're, you're basically referring to a separate group that, that sort of helps teams with their own pipelines. I'm hoping that's what you mean. Um, that is correct. Okay, good. Um, so I like to refer to the individual development team as either being DevOps or not. And so, you know, the existence of a, of a team to help them become more DevOps is great. 
but um, uh, but you can't rely on that silo DevOps team to do it for you. You you have to become DevOps yourself as a development team with the assistance of that that external team. Um, uh, and they are constantly at odds. I feel like the security. Yeah. So this is the problem. I, I when I got started at at Comcast, I you know I walked into executives two weeks after I was there, and I was like, "There's a complete lack of trust uh, between the security group and the the developers, and especially the developers that want to do de development right, more modern ways like DevOps ways." And um, so this was six years ago. So the DevOps was still relatively new back then, um, and. Uh, you know, I basically said that the security people basically think developers are lazy and they're just going to put crap out there that's going to get us hacked. And that shows in every way they act and every way they communicate and every way they behave and all the way their programs and processes are structured. And, and the development teams are like, well, those security guys don't understand the way, the right way to do security in a DevOpsy way. And I'm just going to ignore them because they, they, they're giving me unfunded mandates and and actually, they can get away with ignoring them. Developers have a lot of power um, it, because you know it's very hard to to attract and retain top development talent. Um, it's also hard to attract and retain top security talent um, as well. But you know, it, 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 if a developer feels like he's getting too much pressure from security, they'll just take another job offer where their where their security group gets it and does it in a DevSecOps way. So the program that I help companies launch is really about this organizational restructuring. Um, I have a whole slide deck that talks about that. That isn't the deck I presented today. Um, I do have, there are recordings of me presenting that other one, but I'd be glad to sort of walk it through, walk through it with you separately, Anthony. Um, if you wanna, you know, ping me on, direct message me on LinkedIn, I'll be glad to set up a time for that. But, but just sort of to tease the idea here is that there's two key roles that, that are missing that I introduce very early on. One is uh, I call a coach and you can call it a secure development lifecycle coach or an AppSec coach or a DevSecOps coach or, you know, what you preface it with is not really important. But the coach is, is like a Ted Lasso kind of coach. If you're familiar with that TV show, Ted Lasso is, is a coach uh, for American football. And he is hired to be the head coach of a European football soccer team. And he knows nothing about soccer, never even played it himself. And, but he knows about people and he knows about getting people to work well and getting people to improve and, and people to improve their, their working together. And, and so he, he's good at that. And so you, I want you to hire not security experts. I want you to hire people that are good at sort of connecting with developers and getting them. And this is typically what scrum masters are. So my first few hires into this coaching role were scrum master type people um, at Comcast. And um, uh, the second role is pipeline engineering. And your DevOps team might be doing a lot of this. Um, so working with the DevOps team to make sure that the sort of templates, the recipes, uh, it's really easy for people to self-service. That's the sort of stuff you'd have to do with it. But the, the pipeline engineers also own the tools, the scanning tools. And so those folks would sort of be the ones to run down false positives and make sure they never happen again. And so that's what that's the role you need people in. Um, and a lot of uh, most security groups, when I first start working with them at large enterprises, don't have people in either of these two roles. And, and, and they, they might have a, a security engineering team, but it, they, they don't consider it their job to essentially eliminate false positives in the tools. That they're doing. Um, that's really what the DevOps team is, pipeline engineering as well as so I, so I, I was responsible for both pipeline engineering and SDL coaching, secure development lifecycle coaching. And so I basically we had one unified team that we worked together with. Um, I, I, I would just sort of try to get as close to that as you possibly can in your organization. Um, to do that, but you got to have the coaching role. In fact, that's more key than the pipeline engineering role. Um, but please connect with me. I'd love to answer more. We are just about at time. I want to give folks time for their next call. Thank you. Uh, appreciate it. All right, then, Larry, thank you very much for being participative and answering all the questions. Uh, folks, a little bit of information on the training. Check out the trainings that we have at uh, Practical DevSecOps. They're self-paced instructor-led, also online browser-based. 
interactive lab environment, something that Larry touched upon. With that, the webinar is recorded. It will be available in, um, in LinkedIn. Yes, that is correct. Also on YouTube. Until then, Larry, thank you very much for being our guest today. Participants, appreciate you sticking around till the very end. See you in the next EFSA Cops Live on another Thursday a month from now. See you later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.